So I'm here to talk to you about, um, I think, a possible path toward interdisciplinary communication, which is rooted in epistemology and metaphysics. And I'm going to be drawing from two significant 20th century scholars. One is Bernard Lonergan, the Canadian Jesuit that I spoke about two years ago, and also uh, Ian Barber, uh, an American Protestant uh, theologian and very significant physicist. So just some background. We're all aware, uh, particularly at th this conference, uh, of the problem. Our conference chairman and many of you uh, have, have written and, and uh, documented this issue and also worked toward a solution. And so I think we're all on the same page on the importance of promoting interdisciplinary communication for the advancement of research. And these two scholars, uh, Ian Barber and Bernard Lonergan, were also concerned with the question. And they were in agreement that to promote interdisciplinary research, we should have a common epistemology and a common metaphysics for the disciplines that we're trying to place into some type of interaction. So our question, can we build philosophical bridges to promote interdisciplinary communication? Can we unify two disciplines? You can choose the disciplines, maybe two disciplines that you work in. Can we unify them with a comprehensive conceptual scheme? And if so, what type of integration can be achieved between them if we can formulate a systematic synthesis through a shared epistemology and an inclusive metaphysics. So let's just define some terms. People sometimes use these um, words very differently. So, so you know where I'm coming from when I talk about epistemology. Our English word comes from the Greek uh, word for knowledge. And it's simply the branch of philosophy concerned with the theory of knowledge. And so epistemologists will study the nature of knowledge, the justification for knowledge, and the rationality of belief. When I speak about metaphysics, I'm looking primarily to the great Greek philosopher Aristotle. The, he wrote many books, including uh, a book called Physics, and his metaphysics was entitled uh, such because it literally went beyond the physics. It went to a more fundamental level. So this is the branch of philosophy that engages the most general principles underlying reality and knowledge. We often say it's the science of being as being. And like all sciences in the Aristotelian schema, it's about knowledge through causes. And we can speak about the material and formal objects of this discipline. The material object is being, the whole of reality. And we don't put constraints on that. It could be subjective or objective. It could be possible being or actual being. Abstract or concrete. Immaterial or material. Infinite or finite. So the, the, the formal object is simply being as being. And as a result, everything that exists comes within the scope of metaphysics. A metaphysician is, by, by his profession, interested in all disciplines. Of course, other sciences place necessary restrictions. For example, physics studies phenomena from the point of view of quantity, or perhaps we could say more precisely, measure. Mathematics is concerned with those things which have quantity, or as a colleague pointed out to me, we can say more generally and in a better way, things that can be characterized by abstract structure and relationships. Measurements may be only one dimension of this. But again, metaphysics has no restrictions. And so 
it has that foundational role, the possibility for that foundational role in interdisciplinary communication. Its domain is all of reality. So who are these 20th century scholars that I'm, uh, I've been inspired by and, and am reflecting on, trying to develop their thought? Uh, first, Ian Barber was a, a physicist by first training. He later got into theology uh, in a very interesting way. Uh, Bernard Lonergan was trained in philosophy, mathematics, classics, and theology, and also got into economics later in his life, macroeconomic theory. Both Barber and Lonergan develop an epistemology which they call critical realism, and we'll make that clear shortly. Barber developed a, a metaphysical system based on the work of the great mathematician, logician, and philosopher of science, Alfred North Whitehead, so-called process thought, process philosophy. Bernard Lonergan, on the other hand, develops what he calls a generalized empirical method. And this is uh, a method in which the being investigated is that which occurs within one's own consciousness. So what I'll do briefly this morning is just compare and contrast their two approaches and also uh, very briefly critically engage them. No approach is perfect. So we begin with Barber. Barber was born in Peking. His father was from Scotland. His mother was an American. Uh, he studied physics and eventually became a professor of physics at Kalamazoo College. During his first sabbatical opportunity, he went to Yale Divinity, and he enjoyed his study of theology so much he stayed for two years, earning the Bachelor of Divinity degree, which would now be, would be a Master of Divinity. Uh, Barber's been recognized internationally. He was given the opportunity to deliver the Gifford Lectures in Scotland, which I believe is the most prestigious academic award. In, in Scottish academia, and he was also granted the Templeton Prize. Barber's time at Yale Divinity was a very decisive experience for him in his development as a scholar. It was enabled by a Ford Foundation fellowship. And as I mentioned, he, he enjoyed that work so much that he, he extended his sabbatical. He took courses at Union Theological and ultimately earned his degree, and then accepted a post in Carleton College with a dual appointment in physics and philosophy. As a result of Barber's time at Yale, he began to engage the problem of what is the relationship of the natural sciences with religion or the academic discipline of theology. And he formulated four typologies of interaction, which we can think of even more generally with other disciplines. First is conflict. There could be an inherent conflict between the two disciplines, such that communication, dialogue integration is not possible. Two disciplines might be independent. They might be going on parallel courses, hence, few opportunities for fruitful, beneficial interaction. But there might be opportunities for dialogue. And between theology and science, Barber said there are methodological and conceptual parallels. There are also limit questions or presuppositions. A limit question would be a question that comes up in the practice of science, which is not answerable by the methods of science. Why is there a universe? Why is it intelligible? Questions like that. And the ideal paradigm of interaction between two fields, according to Barber, is integration. He points to the practice of natural theology, that is, doing theology based on reason alone without the benefit of supernatural revelation, just reflecting on nature. A theology of nature and one in which one is operating within one's own religious framework and then explores how 
a religious teaching or a theological doctrine might be updated in light of modern science. And finally, the systematic synthesis. And this would occur through the common epistemology and the inclusive metaphysics. This would be the highest degree of integration. So what is Barber's epistemology? What is his critical realism all about? Well, Barber is coming from this problem as a scientist, as an experimental physicist. And he views theories as representations of the world. And so he is always a philosophical realist. In the inaugural issue of a, what is now a prestigious journal, Zygon, uh, in 1966, Barber first introduced his notion of critical realism. He wrote a very popular book, Issues in Science and Religion, and it's with that book that he really popularized this epistemology. Unfortunately, Barber does not define his critical realism in a rigorous way as a professional philosopher would, but as you read through his works, you do get a clear picture uh, of what he's talking about. And so, in defining his critical realism, he begins by saying what it is not. He rejects the positivist epistemology that views theories as merely summaries of data. He rejects instrumentalism, which sees theories as simply useful tools, not related to truth. And he rejects idealism that reduces theories to simply mental structures disconnected from external reality. So in order to justify this realism, which he hopes to apply both to the natural sciences as well as theology, he confronts these other common epistemologies present in the mid 20th century. I'll share with you a quote. Against the positivist, the realist asserts that the real is not the observable. Against the instrumentalist, he affirms that valid concepts are true as well as useful. Against the idealist, he maintains that concepts represent the structure of events in the world. The patterns in the data are not imposed by us, but originate at least in part in objective relationships in nature. The object, not the subject, makes the predominant contribution to knowledge. Hence, science is discovery and exploration, not just construction and invention. And Barber acknowledges that he's among some significant thinkers in insisting on epistemological realism. Thinkers like Planck, Einstein, Campbell, Workmeister, Whitehead, Nagel, the neo thomists According to Barber, the creativity of the human imagination and the presence of mental constructs does influence our interpretation of experiences, including scientific ones. And so this is where Barber introduces the critical aspect, acknowledging the creativity of the human mind as well as the presence of true patterns in events that are not the product of our mental operations. His realism also recognizes the, indirect, the indirectness of reference and the realistic intent of scientific language. So this critical realism supports both the highly abstract nature of theoretical physics, as well as the requirement for corresponding experimental investigation. In summary, his realism posits that scientific theories are representations of the objective world. A theory is valid for a scientist if it is both true and useful, not only useful. And he also recognizes that all scientific theories are incomplete and selective. They describe particular aspects of nature for specific purposes. He's very careful to avoid the errors of literalism and fictionalism in models. Often in his writings, Barber says that the critical realism 
must take models seriously, but not literally. And Barber posits that being, being is being as event, and this precedes knowing. So let's say now something briefly about his philosophy of being, his metaphysics. I mentioned that he draws uh, his system from process thought. Process thought goes back to even before Aristotle with Herac Heraclitus of Ephesus or Heraclitus. And uh, Heraclitus theory of ubiquitous dynamicity posits a cosmic fire as the source of all change in the cosmos. You may have heard his philosophical doctrine summed up as everything flows or no man ever steps in the same river twice. With later philosophical developments in Greece, we see a counter model emerge, that of Aristotle with his substance metaphysics. And it really was not until Whitehead that the Aristotelian system was seriously challenged. Whitehead was a mathematician and logician in England and uh, eventually came to the United States to teach at Harvard University as a professor of the philosophy of science. And he gave the Lowell Lecture in which he stated that nature is a structure of evolving processes. Reality is the process. In the next years, Whitehead developed this view into an entire metaphysics in a book entitled Process and Reality. Like Barber, he was given the opportunity to deliver the Gifford Lectures. Whitehead begins his quest stating that his goal is to develop a speculative philosophy, a coherent, logical, necessary system of general ideas in terms of which every element of our experience can be interpreted. And this philosophy must have a rational side. It must be coherent and logical. An empirical side that is applicable and adequate. Barber in many ways adopts, adapts, and simplifies Whitehead's very detailed and very complex metaphysics. He identifies four aspects of Whitehead's system that are particularly consistent with 20th century science as he sees it. The primacy of time, the interconnection of events, reality as organic process, and the self-creation of every entity. And so Barber finds this metaphysics as a very suitable first philosophy for natural science. It focuses on concepts of temporality, indeterminacy, and holism. And it has a lot in common also with evolutionary biology. It emphasizes historical continuity. He also appreciates the parallels with general systems theory with the systems philosophy of Laszlo and with the cybernetics of Norbert Wiener. Now let's look at Lonergan. Lonergan, as I mentioned, is a Canadian who had a very diverse education in philosophy, mathematics, and theology. And he taught at a number of universities in Canada as well as in Rome at his alma mater the Gregorian University. Perhaps Lonergan's most famous book is entitled Insight, and it's here that he lays out his generalized empirical method. GEM. The GEM divides the process of human knowing into four levels, experience, understanding, judgment, and finally decision. He refers to the generalized empirical method as both a transcendental method and a critical realism, but a different critical realism than Barber. Like Barber, this realism is inspired by the practice of natural science. Lonergan wants to avoid naive realism, what he calls naive realism, and empiricism on the other hand. Following Thomas Aquinas, Lonergan maintains realism by according a priority to being 
and affirming that man does, can and does make true judgments of fact and value. But in light of Kant, Lonergan also incorporates a critical aspect. He sought to establish a theory of cognition in critiques of the operations of the human mind. One of the goals of his generalized empirical method is to inspire an intellectual conversion. And that's a process by which an individual has personally engaged the tasks of a cognitional theory, an epistemology, a metaphysics, and finally, a methodology. You can think of this as a con this conversion as a breakthrough to one's own mind. If you've ever read the Confessions by St. Augustine, something similar happened for him in the year 386. So Lonergan's critical realism emerges from a personal journey of philosophical self-appropriation. In the book Insight, he uses exercises that stimulate insights from mathematics, the natural sciences, and common sense. For Lonergan, the key question is, what do I say about my own mind? He writes, the crucial issue is an experimental issue, and the experiment will be performed not publicly, but privately. It will consist in one's own rational self-consciousness, clearly and distinctly taking possession of itself as rational self-consciousness. Up to that decisive achievement, all leads. From it all follows. No one else, no matter what his knowledge or his eloquence, no matter what his logical rigor or his persuasiveness, can do it for you. To get to that fourth level of the generalized empirical method, to make a responsible decision, Lonergan says that one needs the intellectual conversion that consists in getting those first three steps correct. According to Paul Allen, a philosopher, what's crucial to appreciate about Lonergan's theory of knowing is that the justification of critical realism, particularly as a theological epistemology, arises from the success of theological method. It's not something presupposed by our artificially imposed categories. Another philosopher, Andreas Losch, has shown that Lonergan's critical realism includes the medieval sense of the term vis-a-vis -vis the reality of universals. Going back to Barber, his realism is primarily concerned with the question of the existence of, spatio -temporal, of the spatio-temporal cosmos in light of Kant. So it's a little more restrictive. Phil Thompson points out that Lonergan made a significant contribution with his epistemology as it indeed created a bridge or a single perspective that could be shared by mathematicians, natural scientists, philosophers, and theologians to promote an authentic dialogue. So let's look at Lonergan's metaphysics. Very, in a very unique way, he defines his metaphysics um, the axioms of his metaphysics as not a set of propositions, but the dynamic structures of the human mind. The generalized empirical methods metaphysics includes the relationships between the processes that guide our wonder, as well as the realities that we wonder about. He posits that when they operate successfully, the processes of wonder form an integrated set, isomorphic, to the integral dimensions of reality. For example, the scientific process that moves from data to hypothesis to verification aligns well with Lonergan's view that knowing moves from experience to understanding to judgment, as well as Aristotle's view that reality consists of potency, form, and act. So in the generalized empirical method, metaphysics compromises both the process of knowing and the corresponding features of anything that can be known. Lonergan talks about different stages of metaphysics. 
we can have a latent metaphysics, and this would certainly be common to everybody. You could have what Lonergan classifies as a problematic metaphysics. And this is his very critical view of previous attempts to formulate one. And then you can have an explicit metaphysics, and this is following his path, which comes about through a process of self-appropriation. For Lonergan, the method of metaphysics is primarily pedagogical, and again, it's aimed at that self-appropriation. So the starting point is persons as they are, and that explicit metaphysics is an achievement. Very quickly, we'll look at Lonergan's functional specialties. In his probably second most famous book, Method in Theology, Lonergan groups the processes by which theology reflects on religion in eight specializations, each with functional relationships to the other. And you'll notice here one of the specializations, one of the specialties is communications. So he was already thinking about this issue of interdisciplinary communication. And these specialties can be adapted and applied outside of theology as well. Lonergan himself extended the notion to the fields of ethics, history, and the human sciences. The functional specialties imply four levels of human transcendence, being attentive, intelligent, responsible, reasonable, and responsible. And these four levels function in the two phases of understanding, reflecting on the past and moving toward the future. We learn about the past by moving through the processes of research, interpretation, history, and dialectical evaluation. We move into the future by moving downward through foundational commitments, basic doctrines, systematics, and communication. Lonergan points out that the future moves quickly into the past and the process continues. So I'll just conclude with some critical engagement. In my view, and unfortunately in the wake of Descartes and Kant, both Barber and Lonergan's critical realism does not give an adequate account of the significant metaphysical fact that the simple actuality of being precedes the knowing of any particular subject. Barber's critical realism could be interpreted as an attempt to elevate potency over act. And this situation presents two interrelated aspects that are problematic. Barber envisions that being precedes subjective knowledge as process, not as actuality, and being as process can never be fully known. The mind grasps only changing parts, not the actual whole. And unity is a transcendental property of all being. Thomas Aquinas talks about this in his book on truth. And Barber's writings indicate a desire to address the partial cumulative nature of scientific discovery, as well as the dynamicity of creation. He focuses on potency and the immediacy of entities in the world. But, his, but physics or philosophy like Whitehead's that in some sense is more physical than metaphysical is inadequate for exploring the most fundamental questions of reality. I think a better metaphysics would acknowledge that we have to presume an underlying stable reality in order to maintain rationality. Primacy is in act, which is the ground of potency. We move from potency to act. A rational metaphysics must presuppose that there is a stable truth to discover about things. We call this essences. So whether in the form of full-fledged dogmatic idealism or in the more modest approach of Barber and Lonergan's critical realism, there's an inclination to offer a correction to the spontaneous certainty of what I would call moderate realism. I believe the existence of a bridge between the mind and external reality should be an axiom of epistemology. And as we all know, we don't prove axioms. They're self-evidently true. Coming to the end of my time, so I'll just jump to the end. I 
last slide. So some conclusions. I believe that philosophy, especially metaphysics and epistemology, has an important role in interdisciplinary communication. Some of the insights of Barber for the theology science interaction are certainly applicable for bringing other fields into beneficial communication. Lonergan's generalized empirical method and functional specialties offer interesting and creative opportunities for interdisciplinary communication. But neither of these proposals are perfect. We're on a journey. Thank you.